on just some really cool examples uh, that could actually, um, you know, happen here, right? So, um, so you know, uh, this is all about collaboration. I don't know if anyone else has read uh, Walter Isaacson's book. He's got to do the Steve Jobs uh, biography. He's like, place with innovators. It's all about getting a crowd of diverse individuals in the same place, talking, interacting, um, sharing experiences, and, and using that to, to do bigger things, right? And um, I see bioprinting. You know, is going to dramatically benefit from, from 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 things just like this. Getting cell biologists and getting the um, the, the the people with 3D printing, the mechanical engineering, the biomaterials, all in the same room, um, focus on something. So definitely ask lots of questions, engage, connect. I want to meet everybody here, so please come up and introduce yourself. Um, and today I'll be talking about tissue engineering, uh, which is at the kind of the basis of bioprinting. If you're going to bioprint something, it has to turn into a tissue. And uh, and so these are you know some of the some of the basic technologies that we use in this field, you know, which is basically bringing living cells together with uh, biomaterials, um, kind of hold them hold them up, hold them all together, and give them some structure um, while they're turned into a tissue. And then dynamic biological environments, which I'm not really going to focus on today. It's uh, it's one of the things that are um, that are uh, kind of missing from um, from today's uh, program. Uh, we definitely try to fill that, but uh, but I think we'll get there in the future. Um, and then this can be used to make functional tissues and organs. So, and I start up a research bio, which I'm not going to really be talking about today, um, you know, specifically to address the, the cellular component of this field. So, um, yeah, I think we're at a, uh, a special time. So, tissue engineering was actually, you know, the first like NSF meeting was held in '88, right? And been going on for like, 10 years before there. So, it's actually maturing as a field, right? And, and I kind of think in books. I read a lot of books, and so this is the cover of the Seminal Tissue Engineering text. Um, but we are in the middle of this with this other thing that's happening, which is the maker movement, which many of you are probably familiar with, right? This uh, move towards making things and, and doing things. Um, there's these hacker spaces uh, that have been created where everybody can, 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 can you know, fab stuff. And now you have biohacker spaces like bugs. Which is really exciting, and you know this is what Chris Anderson's calling you know this, the next industrial revolution leading to local manufacturing. You know, and then you've got you know, this is all driven, um, you know, not just by three D printing, but three D printing is a very important component of this. And you know, I also like to think in Venn diagrams, right? And so we're here, right? So we're right in the middle of this, and it is going to be require lots of different disciplines. And this is actually a really special time in tissue engineering. I've been in this field for over twenty years. And I don't look that old, but I am. And right now, specifically, this. And the motivations for the field are are different, right? So one, you know, is that you know people are dying waiting for tissues and tissues and organs to become available, right? So you know, this is. Um, the number of people on the waiting list for tissue organ over time, and the number of transplants per year has pretty much topped out because you know you just don't have you know more people dying in a better way, so that their organs are in good enough shape to transplant, 
right? This is not getting better. The, the gap is getting wider. And now, on average, 21 people die every day, um, I think, in the U.S., um, you know, because the organ is not made available for transplant, right? And so this field of tissue engineering started at, you know, lots of places, but mostly Boston, um, you know, the MIT Harvard guys talking together. And, and the idea here is that, you, you know, from a patient, you can isolate cells, expand these cells up um, in cell culture. Um, we have a demo on this. I'll be showing kind of what um, mesenchymal stem cells are like, how you get them out how you expand them to, to greater volumes uh, during the dental component. You see these on a three-dimensional scaffold, so these, this biomaterial component will give the cells, the individual cells structure while they develop into a tissue. Um, what's uh, very important is that the, the cells need biological factors, right? These mesenchymal stem cells that I make, they can go from cartilage, bone, tendon, some people think they can turn them into liver, um, and they all require different biological factors and then making them in this dynamic bioreactor type environment. And this, this is all has to be automated, and to me, this is one of the big things holding the field back as well. But then, we, with the tools that we already have, we show that you can make tissues and transplant them back into the patient, right? And and there's been products on the market since the late '90s, um, tissue engineered skin, tissue engineered cartilage, that are that are being used in the clinic today, which is really really great. So that's one of the motivations for this. The other motivation, you know, what I'm really excited about is, is just for the people that think this is really cool. And this next slide is, um, I got it from collaborators and uh, they sent it to me, it's like 50 megabytes, right? So a little, little bit of a delay here. But um, this is people who just want to do really cool stuff with tissue engineering, right? They want to build the non-medical applications, right? And so there's this, there's this group of people at, at uh, between MIT, Georgia Tech, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that are doing what they call forward engineering, right? Where they're they're basically saying, hey, we want to do this. And so how do we actually design not a tissue organ for transplantation, but to do something completely different? And they're building biological machines, right? And so they're taking um, you know, all sorts of different uh, muscle cells, neurons, um, uh, blood vessel cells, and, uh, and, and designing cellular systems. And these are a couple of... Uh, of movies, we'll see if we can get to make biological robots, right? And so, the, in popular science, this was um, this was created. You know, so this is a biological robot. It's got cardiac muscle cells on the bottom, a bioprinted hydrogel, which is propelling it forward. That's the fastest biobot five years ago. I think it was ten times as fast today. And right to Raman um, is uh, giving a talk at the end of the day via Skype from there. Um, you know, Roger Kahn and lots of other people are making these prefer perfuse vascular systems, and so they made vascular networks in, in vitro and are pulsing blood cells through them, right? So that's, that's that. And then that's a, uh, I think it's a sperm bot, um, but, uh, you know, it's something that uh, has been, it also University of Illinois that, that is, uh, is meant to do that. And so they're, they're actually seeing this as creating an entirely new discipline of integrated cellular systems to create, you know, living biological machines. Uh, very interesting. I'm on the industry advisory panel of this group. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's cool. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff. And, and um, so from Jennifer West Lab, uh, David Koleski, a grad student there, will be giving a talk on confused vascular systems later today, also be a guy. He's in Boston. Um, really tremendous work going on at these universities. Um, so uh, as well as locally, it's really cool stuff at Maryland, Hopkins, Maricom, and, uh, and, uh, and um, and, and around here, we just weren't necessarily able to get everybody here from the from the biomedical side. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about cell sources today and some biomaterials, right? So, in, in tissue engineering, you know, you know, one phrase that we hear a lot is this allogeneic versus autologous. All that means is autologous is your own cells. Allogeneic is I can use Ryan cells to treat me and everybody else. Um, and uh, and lots of biology happening, but it is possible to to do that. Um, and uh, I'm not going to really focus on any of that um, because I don't think we're really talking biomedical applications here. Um, using somatic tissue specific cells, so you know you can take any tissue in the body, a liver, a heart, a blood vessel, isolate those cells out of it, culture those up, and then build, try to um, you know build a new tissue out of it. Um, these are some of the cells that I see being used by biohackers. And then stem cells, and there's lots of different types of stem cells. There's adult stem cells. Um, I use I, I commercialize adult stem cells from the bone marrow or, or fat. Um, there's embryonic stem cells and these pluripotent stem cells. These are newer technologies. Um, 
uh, much more difficult to use, but a really exciting um, uh, technology moving forward. Um, so these, uh, these, I shouldn't get too much into this, but the, uh, um, all of these are moving toward the clinic, if not really used in the clinic. And you know, this is uh, you know, the kind of clinical progression. So autologous, the alginaic cells from adult cells have been used in the clinic for you know, 20, 30 years, um, if not longer, depending on how you count a stem cell. And then fetal stem cells have also been used. And then these embryonic stem cells just started entering the clinic, and iPS cells are moving rapidly towards the clinic. But uh, the, the more mature technology is, the more robust it is, the cheaper it is. If you want to do something at a, at a biohacker space, you're much more likely to do it with adults, adult derived cells than the induced or embryonic um, stem cells, only because those are still pretty hard to culture and need daily attention. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, but the, the stem cells, both the embryonic stem cells, the embryonic stem cells, they come from, you know, a blastocyst, um, from a, from a pre-implantation um, embryo, and uh, the embryo is discarded, um, and these stem cells have extensive um, self-renewal. They can generate tons and tons and tons of stem cells, but then also, once you, di um, once you expand them, you can differentiate them into any tissue in the body. And it sounds really great, but it's really hard to do, and still very expensive, right? Um, and so while this is an important um, technology in the future, it's probably not something that's going to happen um, unless you have someone with, with 10 years' experience doing that at some place like Bucks, right? Um, then adult cells can now be programmed for pluripotency. This is an induced pluripotent stem cell, so no embryo has to die for you to make your stem cells, right? You just take some skin cells, take some blood cells, and then, again, make cells that you can make huge volumes of at a cost, and then differentiate them down to any tissue in the body. And that's really great. It's, it's the newest and, and currently the most common. Um, the bone marrow is, is, a, is a place um, that's rich in stem cells. You have metaphoric stem cells that turn into blood type. Um, they make your T cells and your, um, and your blood cells. And these are going through clinical trials and, and curing cancer today, which is really, really exciting. Um, you know, the cells that we use are, the, are these, uh, these stromal stem cells. Um, and, you know, the traditional thing that they, that they were taught is that these stem cells could turn into the mesenchymal tissues, the, the, the bone, the cartilage, the muscles, um, the tendons, the, the fat tissue in the body. And they can, um, but they've been working forward, moving forward in the clinic. And this is where I spent my last 10 years is manufacturing these cells to be used for, um, as uh, regenerative drugs, drugs to treat things like stroke, traumatic brain injury, um, you know, congestive heart failure, um, that will, uh, when the immune system gets out of whack, like graft versus host disease and, uh, and Crohn's disease, but then also to build tissues and, and uh, be used for gene delivery. They've been using over 30,000 patients to date, excellent safety profile, and people are really learning how to use these cells. Um, so I'm selling into those markets with my cells, and that's where the money is today. The thing that excites me most is really this, that MSCs are critical raw materials for bioprinting. Right? If you're gonna, most people that are in bioprinting, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bioprint something of a specific shape, it's most likely gonna be a bone uh, or cartilage that needs that shape. And so, um, and so what we're doing is we're providing these simple to use, really affordable, so that anybody can can uh, can you know generate hundreds of millions, if not billions, of high quality cells. We have someone at at, at, uh, at uh, in College Park that's trying to tissue engineer a femur, right? And a femur is pretty big, need billions of cells. And there's no way to get, to get enough cells to do their experiments um, until we take over. And so, you know, just uh, you know, with um, with uh, with this in mind, the cellular tools that I think biohackers are going to use are somatic cells isolated from animal tissues. You can go to a slaughterhouse, um, you know, get a get a a, a bone um, and isolate bone marrow, isolate cartilage off that. Uh, if you do it within within the first day, you'll get plenty of uh, of uh, of, of living cells, um, muscle cells, you know, a, a calf. You know, when I was in graduate school, I was able to buy a calf for $1,000 and that would isolate as much cartilage from it as possible. Um, when it was, you know, it was, you know, the, I won't go into that, but, uh, <laughs> but they have a lot of muscle as well. And, and tons of muscle cells you can get out of this, right? And so these, these are some of the, um, you know, the, the raw materials that people are using for some really cool things. Um, cell lines, that, uh, if they were donated from uh, academic labs, they're simple to use. Um, and uh, and then you know these MSCs isolated from either animals or humans. 
Um, we hope to you know, be able to offer these as raw materials for, like you said, the cellular hobbyist. Um, and they still cost a decent amount of money. So the, you know, the other thing I think to do to get uh, bioprinting off the ground is the biomaterials, right? Lots of different types of biomaterials that are used in tissue engineering today. Um, you've got uh, um, your, your polyglycolic acids, biolactic acids. So anyone in bioprinting here in 3D printing, you know, those PLGA is one of the main materials, right? I bought the three noodler kind of thing, and, and you know, and one of the, one of the two materials you can use is the PLGA. These are biodegradable. You put them in the body, and they'll degrade within within three to four months. And what people do is they make these into highly coarse structures. These either as a fiber-based message, fiber-based um, meshes, or uh, or like highly coarse sponges, um, and uh, and. And then they see the cells on the inside, the cells grow, give them the right biological signals, they differentiate into that tissue. Um, uh, the collagens and the hydrogels are two of the, um, are two of the, the, the main materials that are going to be used where you want to extrude both the cell and the material at the same time. And, um, and you'll see uh, some of this in the demo. So one of the things in the demo I've got in this, okay, so um, there's uh, you know, so I did my PhD in, in biomaterials design, right? And you can incorporate all sorts of biological features into material to help guide the, the gene expression and thus the tissue development. So I'm not really going to go through this, but it's a really big field. There's a lot of design stuff you can get in here. And then there's some low tech stuff that you can do in a place like this, again, so that you don't need you know, 10 years of training in biomaterials in order to do this correctly. And these will be some of the, some of the materials that, that you see. But you can incorporate all the biological um, signals in the biomaterials to drive what the cells do. So um, I spent a lot of my uh, life um, before 10 years ago um, on alginates. Uh, alginates are a hydrogel material isolated from seaweed, um, and uh, and what it is is um, it's a, it's a copolymer. It's a long chain molecule um, made up of sugars, right? Of these gluronic and manuronic acid. And uh, for you chemists out there, they're um, they're uh, Atomers of each other on the, on the five carbon, one um, OH goes up, or carboxylic acid goes up, the other comes down, and this leads to different chains. And when you have two M's next to each other, the manuronic acids, um, they form this long extended chain. If um, you have two G's next to each other, they form this kink. And then this leads to uh, a very interesting characteristic where it binds calcium really tightly and this cross links it. So I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you what that is. And there, um, it's a hydrogel, so these are lots of OHs and, and, um, and, uh, and carboxylic acids, so it's highly hydrophilic, so it holds water. Very little material, it holds a lot of water, it's like gel. So the structure uh, of these alginates, um, again, they're long chains made up of uh, blocks of Gs, which are pink, blocks of Ms, which are linear. And when you add calcium, which is a divalent cation, between the Gs it forms this ionic bridge, right? And what this does is it crosses. It brings that part out of solution, holds the water in place, and then this, the, the M's are the spacers in between this. Okay? And so what that means is that if you just take uh, a liquid solution of even just 1% alginate and drop it into calcium chloride, um, you get a solid gel. And so here um, I isolated some cells, and we'll be doing this next door, um, and, uh, and mix them in. With the alginate, water, right? So the you know cells need water with nutrients in order to survive. Um, you drip them into uh, calcium chloride; they can form these uh, spheres. And then these were used for immunoprotection. Actually, the first um, uh, pancreatic islet transplants were done in alginate in alginate hydrogels. And what this does it can help mass it up, you know, from the immune system. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And then ten years later, I got type one diabetes, and I don't have a pancreas anymore. So I'm kind of hoping for this technology to eventually. Not make it just into the clinic, but through clinical trials. Um, what uh, one of the things I did in in, uh, in graduate school was uh, was that we actually used this as injectable polymer systems. So you mix you know, bone cells and cartilage cells in this, you inject it under the under the skin of rats, and you can actually form these bone and cartilage systems. Um, and uh, and so we published um, you know in uh, in you know long time ago now. Um, but they can make uh, very uh, in vivo-like systems where this red is bone, the, um, the white is cartilage, and this is what it looks like on the ends of your bones. Right, just showing that this that this is even possible. Um, and then uh, one of the one of the demos 
that we'll show next door is this concept of, oh, well, if calcium can cross-link it, if you slow down the calcium so you can use it, let's use it for injection molding, right? Injection molding is how they make any complex piece of plastic. Um, and so we, uh, we did this to make um, this, uh, this idea of injection molding living tissue. And I um, collaborated with uh, this guy there, Benassi, ben who's ben still doing this stuff at Cornell, and then they will use my PhD advisor. And, uh, and where you can, you, you can bring this, you can you know, make the cells in the alginate, put it into a predefined mold, and, um, and make whatever shape that you want. And so, so I got this going in Larry's lab. So I was more than the materials engineer. He was, and he, had a, he was in a great lab that had lots of, uh, lots of uh, surgeons and, and, and cartilage people. And so what we did is make cartilage uh, in, in the shapes of molds. And so this is actually a silicone rubber chin implant that they use in plastic surgery. You know, you get a car accident, you mess up your chin, they'll just throw a piece of rubber in. And wouldn't it be great if you just make that out of cartilage, right? And so we made a mold out of it. You'll actually see this mold next door. Um, and then if you inject it with cells in, in alginate and control the jelly, then uh, you can actually get a high fidelity um, mold of this, right? And so now you can just print, right? We didn't have 3D printers back in um, 1997. So, um, but, uh, but it, it is pretty cool, and it's still being used. And, um, and uh, they've done tons of characterization of this cartilage and um, this uh, very talented sur surgeon, Sophia Chang, actually you know, picked that up. I taught her how to do it. I went back to Ann Arbor. She's in Boston. And, uh, and she you know, got a paper out of it um, you know, that was finally published in 2001. But this is the initial um, chin implant, and this is a piece of cartilage that's been in, uh, eroded for 30 weeks, and histologically was, was cartilage. Um, when I actually went and got a job, you know, here's an example of, of tissue engineering involved, right? So I went and got a job, I was in the industry, and I was at a, a cell therapy company called Astro Biosciences. And they had what they called tissue repair cells, or TRCs. Just bone marrow cells that had some of stem cells, some of the stem cells, and they're going after bone, bone indications. And so um, since most bones actually heal, they were going after what they call non-union fractures. So people that get in you know, really horrible car accidents have really massive um, injuries that aren't going to heal, um, or, or, or uh, you know, battlefield wounds, or you know, if you, know, you smoke, right? Um, smokers you know, have impaired healing. And, um, and so we actually were running clinical trials on, on curing this by taking um, the cells, so basically bone marrow culture for 12 days with a mix of different types of cells, um, mixing it with a matrix, packing it into the, um, in the, in the fracture site, and, and then taking a lot of these tissue engineering concepts. You know, so we made something which is they call it osteoconduct, which means the bone on the outside can actually grow in. Osteoinducted, meaning that if cells came in, we could turn them into bone. Right, um, that's these uh, secreted biological factors. Osteogenic, so the mesenchymal stem cells are part of this, the cells could actually turn into bone, um, and uh, and then just generally tissue regenerative. There are cells in there which which um, create an environment for wound healing, and that's the, those mesenchymal stem cells that uh, that I work with today. And then magically, you know, uh, you can get you know fully healed bone, or at least that was the, that was the concept. I think the cartoon looks a lot better than the pictures. <laughs> Um, but it was actually really cool, and um, and so we actually worked with a surgeon in Barcelona. Barcelona is great because one, it was an autologous cell. We used patients' own cells, you know, and two, they you know they're all smokers there, right? And so there are a lot of non non union fractures. And uh, but what we did is we used these, these bone chips, these ceramic um, bone matrix, um, which your bone is kind of a ceramic type of material, and you mix the cells in it, but it wasn't really staying in place. And so this this uh, physician. Use autologous plasma. If you take out some blood, spin it down. Take the, and then the plasma at the top, you just add some calcium to that, and it gels into a plot. Right? It's pretty sweet. And so they developed this process where they, uh, they mix the cells, um, mix the, uh, in, in a dish with, uh, with the plasma and, and clotted it using the patient's own cells. And they got this goop of mess that then the physician during the surgery would just go, you know, chunk it into the, to the bone. And also one of the great things about Europe is, uh, is I could, you know, take, I, I could do some work in a laboratory and just say fly to Barcelona and be in the operating room with the surgeons there while they're doing kind of training um, along the way. So it was, uh, it was pretty sweet. And so then they, they put in all the hardware, right? And then you pack the bone and then you, you go. And they had really tremendous results. But they didn't know what was happening to the cells. They weren't tissue engineers. I've been working in cells in three dimensions for a long time, for 15 years. Um, maybe 10, 10 years at this time, 
And so they just needed someone that could know what, if the cells were still healthy because they wanted to do something and the, the FDA would actually require that. And so I got in and I showed that, oh yeah, well if you do this in the system, cells, they'll grow, right? They'll, uh, they, they, they grow over time. Um, you, uh, you know, you take these things and you put them into culture and then, and then have them characterize them and, and they're actually doing a lot of really great stuff. So, you know, here we, um, we've got uh, living cells in green, uh, dead cells are red, so they, they, they increase in number over time. Um, and so just doing a lot of the stuff that I would have done in graduate school, as well as looking at the factors that they're secreting. So all these are biological factors which are driving different components of this, of this wound healing, you know. And then you just shove them into patients, uh, because it's the patient's own cells, you know, and these are all materials that are already used in orthopedic surgery. Um, and this red line, I'm not sure where that came from, so these are really old slides. And when I transferred it over, this, this came in. But um, essentially, you know, this guy, so he was, um, he worked at, he fell in a quarry, right, broke both his legs, and, um, and I think he was, uh, you know, non-union um, for, uh, for at least a year. So this is supposed to be solid right here, right, and it's not. Um, and, uh, and so they went in, and they packed in the cells, and they put in these plates, and the, uh, you can see the bone bridging after s this is six months, and then after 12 months, you actually get really good solid bone along the outside. And um, so after 26 months, he was back to hard labor and was boring, which is a success, because these guys can't walk, right? Um, you know, this is, uh, this is you know, kind of cool. Another th great thing about Barcelona is the running of the bulls, right? Um, and they don't do the smartest things here. But this red bull here, he gets, he gets a little, uh, or maybe it's not that one, maybe it's this next one. Uh, this guy, yeah, so, so he, he starts to go after something. This is actually captured on the news in Barcelona. And this guy, he, he knocks the guy off. Ouch. So um, that guy didn't have a good, a good day. And he was one of Dr. Roscoe's uh, uh, patients, right? So after, this is after six years, this is what his bones still look like, right? It was, it was horrible. So he got into the trial, and um, I'm not a radiologist, but, uh, but this means, um, I, I was told that means the, the bone was actually work. But more importantly, the, the bone is, was healed, but you know, he's back to working 10 months after the surgery for the first time in six years. And that's really the most important thing, because people can't do anything. Yeah? Can this be used for problems stemming from that disease? It could be. I mean, it could, and yeah, I mean, there's lots of, lots of, it can be used in lots of different places. Um, you know, I think the, the take home message and, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing today is that this therapy was too expensive to take to the market. So they actually did move into, while they had a successful phase two trial, they couldn't justify a phase three trial because while the people that need this really need it, there's not enough people out there to, just, to justify the expense. They can do insurers and, and you're talking about talking tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to treat the sex of patients. And while it was a very successful trial, it, it didn't continue, right? I'm going to um, just skip this one. But, yeah, I mean, they were able to, to treat lots of different types of people. This is bone. Um, you know, but these tissue repair cells are also used for, for arterial disease, you know, for diabetes, to adjust heart failure. And, uh, and people are still trying to figure out how to actually run a real clinical trial, a successful clinical trial um, in this field. So, um, you know, as we, as we get back to what we can actually do here, right, obviously you're not going to be treating patients, um, you know, but, you know, these materials, PLG is already using 3D printing, right, if you can get a sterile, um, you can sterilize it probably here, um, uh, you can, you know, basically start to build tissues out of this. Hydrogels in, in printing, the collagen, the gelatins, I mean, you, know, you can isolate rat tail collagen pretty easily. Um, uh, also from, uh, from lots of other types of materials like skin. Um, these alginates, you know, I can call up uh, you know, an alginate supplier and get you know, more alginate than I can use in two years as a free sample because they, they sell like barrels um, uh, for 100 bucks um, in the food industry, right? Everyone here is eating tons and tons of alginate. Um, but, uh, but the alginate that we have over there that you'll see um, is, you know, really cheap to, to play with and really great to print with. Um, and especially when you mix it with the collagen and the fibers, it helps make it uh, cell interactive. Uh, fiber gels are also really easily, and, and true, there's lots of other materials. Um, I just ran out of time to do too much, uh, too much diligence on what could actually be, be done in, in an environment like this. So last, the last slide, so future directions. You know, um, you'll see something about biological robots um, not coming out of Rashid Shears' group, but uh, I'm in the, the grad student doing this. 
is doing really tremendous work um, making these biological machines. I'm still, I'm still not sure what the killer app for this is, but I know it's out there. Um, people are decitherizing entire organs. Um, and you know, this is just something I was taking to work Wake Forest, and, uh, and they decitherized kidneys. And they maintain the cellular branches, and then what they do, they want to do this uh, is recitherize them. There's actually, if, if everyone follows Peter, Peter Diamandis, the X Prize, you invented the X Prize. There are two different X Prizes for tissue engineering, right? Trying to incentivize these, these technical philanthropists, try to, try to push forward the field by incentivizing um, these technologies. One of the things holding back the field is, is getting a perfused vascular network. Um, so that when you implant something, you can hook up, hook up the blood because if you don't get blood to a, a big tissue in a few minutes, it dies, right? So that's holding back the field, and you'll see David Kolesky talk about these vascular networks today. Um, and then this, uh, um, you know, the trachea is, is, has got a lot of press lately. Um, you know, and then other people are putting these organs on the chips for drug screening. I'm not going to really talk about that. So. That's just a really brief and a really quick overview. Uh, there's lots of other things going on today. Um, so there's, there's a ton of the field. Uh, I can uh, hook anybody up that wants to know. There's lots of different papers and review papers to get a, a, a broad overview of the field. I was hoping to bring a few today, but, um, uh, but uh, I was traveling this week. So, but I'm happy to, to share as much as I know. Uh, there's a lot of other people here with this type of experience and, and, and other specific experiences. So. Um, definitely, please talk to your uh, to the people next to you and the people that you didn't come with, and um, and you know we'd love to meet again everybody here. So, thanks a lot. Okay, questions? Yeah, questions. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Um, these are mostly macro um, objects that you're. Making. Um, yep. I'm an so the only place to remain must be right. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Do um, you work also with the microscopic um, scale of uh, cell engineering? So a lot of people do. Um, you know, and that's that. The application for that is, is going to be in say drug screen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the microfluidics is is cool. I like macro things. I like things I can feel and see, right? And um, and if I can do something and not have to use a microscope. That then they, that's my that's my preference, um, but there's you know a huge part of the field is in how microfluidics is going to impact this, and, and the microfluidics is having a big impact in the perfused vascular networks because they're using them the, the microfluidic technology to make the these very very small blood vessels, right? Um, and so there's there's definitely a marriage a marriage here. And to um, from what I understand it to um, segregate different types of, of cells that you're interested in segregating. Yeah, they can't separate them. Um, you know, lots of people work on taking things apart. I like to put them back together, right? But, but yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, you'll you definitely still have to take them apart before you can put them back together. So, <laughs> good question. All right, well, we'll get on with the program. Um, it's, it's not just mammalian cells here. I mean, there's also a lot of really great stuff going on with uh, you know growing up plants. Plants, and mushrooms um, that are turning into building materials and, and fashion materials, um, and uh, things like uh, tissue engineered leather is will make it to the market in the not too distant future. Um, and uh, and I know we're going to hear about uh, some of the plant-based cultures today. So oh, well, I'm more sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I've been I've been looking at this for 20 years, so I'm very yeah. uh, Australia seems to be really big at tissue culture and industrial quantities. Uh -huh. uh, and it's one of the places that sort of pioneered using all this these materials in art. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what can you tell us about the tissue cup? Why 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 Australia and not here? Uh, why do they do things so big over there? Tom <laughs> McDolly. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the, the famous uh, con. Uh, Convict that they did the, the movie about. Uh, I can't think of his reference. Uh, I don't know. I don't, there, there's, there's plenty of stuff going on here. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of stuff going on in Europe and Russia. Um, I mean, there's. I mean, this place it's getting pretty you know diverse. Um, but uh, I mean, tissue engineering kind of um, you know you know grew. It really matured um, in Boston. You know, and uh, and they've been spinning out a lot of the people that have been going around the world, um, and uh, and and expanding. But I mean, there's you know, I don't think you can really 
you know, say in any one place that's that's had the had the biggest impact yet. Um, but uh, but tissue engineering's use of the art world is is really it is kind of an Australian thing. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty it's much pretty wild. And then you know, at the risk of risk of uh, uh, our, our, uh, we have a speaker here also that's speaking about sort of scaling. You know, most of the technology you talk about, other than the splashing it in there like at this border, which is pretty sexy. Um, <laughs> Orthopedic surgeons, man. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, there, there's also a question of just scale. How can you scale something big? I think, I think we have a speaker here that's going to address that concern. <laughs> Siri can't scale. understand you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I think we have a speaker here that's going to address the scaling that could cost issues. Right. Like some of these, uh, uh, some of these uh, hydrogel uh, cell composite. Yeah, that, no, that's a really critical thing because uh, you know it can't be really used in the hardware world until it's more affordable. You know. Um, yeah. So, the picture of the pose. Yes, actually, like, oh, it makes it too much growth. Through or how do you control the liver cell test? How do you know you should be aware of the right place as opposed to the positive class? It itself, it figures it out. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, I mean, that's what they think, right? I mean, no, no, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, cells kind of know how to self segregate. If you actually put, a, you know, you know, uh, you know, multiple cells in, um, in, in culture together, they'll, they, they will segregate and form interesting structures. Um, but uh, I mean, this guy. I mean, it, it's your traditional cowboy surgeon. You know, let me, you know, let me try this, right? Um, and it and it was working, you know. But um, but uh, um, but it was, uh, you know, it's um, it's it's gonna get better as things like bioprint allows us to put the right cell in the right place at the right time, right? But there are some applications where you just throw it all together and, and cross your fingers, and it's, it's actually working. Um, that tells me there's a strong signal that it's going to work eventually. That's the only in the effect, right? But you know, it's, it's it, we're still early days in the field. Yeah. Is there are there some people looking at the sort of structural architecture on those levels? Um, on tension integrity. Yeah, and it's yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, my PhD advisor came from Don Eager's lab, and integrity is up uh, is you know. You know, he, he brought tensor energy to the field of cell biology, right? And this mechanical, chemical signal transduction and how the shape of the cells are, you know, impact the, the differentiation. Um, and uh, and there are people looking at this. How it's all going to fold up into these, these broader applications can take a long time to filter up. Um, but it's uh, but but it will. We'll get stuff working that hasn't sorry, that's not dependent on that first. And then, then as we get into more and more sophisticated applications, that's where all this research will eventually get coalesced into, you know, something that's uh, really awesome. Yeah. You had mentioned leathers mm -hmm. coming onto the market. That's one thing that I've seen at the beginning of biomaterials and applications of this, because you can do curing process as a print, basically. Right. You know, um, and I, I kind of take a look at if we look at these integrated structures and materials that we can build these bioorganic electrical structures and integrate things like connective tissue as stitching elements, yeah. you know, for like zero breathing, that G environments when they talk about, you know, where they need a certain pressure mm -hmm. to keep people intact. Like being able to just engineer that directly into printing leather, you know, right, right, right. that seems and it's stitching. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be amazing what we can do. Um, and as the costs come down, um, it'll, it'll really, I think, expand. Dan, do you have a question? Yeah, so yeah, I was just wondering if you, if you know anything about um, like open source software tools that can that are enabling people to work on problems like this in more automated ways without necessarily being in the lab, especially in a place like a citizen science place like this, where I mean, where a lot of this the work you're showing is not going to happen anytime soon. There's a lot of contribution that you can still do from like your MacBook at home. Right, contributing lines of code. I, mean, I don't know a lot of those, like a lot of those projects, but I'm sure there have to be some out there. There, there probably are. Um, I that's outside of like where I'm, where I've been focusing on. I mean, it's such a convergent field. There's right? so many different technologies. Um, but you know, I'd imagine you know Ryan would probably know a lot more about that than than, than I would. Are, do you know anything? Yeah. In what sense do you mean, like in terms of 
like uh, tools or, or even um, analysis uh, and modeling of like what what actually happens to I mean like figuring out what ha what is controlling where these cells are going and uh, where they're differentiating software tools to help people more intelligently engineer them rather than just like having cowboys throwing it in and seeing what happens. I don't know of anything, any tools that do basically like biological FEA, right? It's kind of like what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Like the fourth dimension, know, right? Yeah. We can simulate a lot of that stuff like in terms of physical reactions. I don't know, like in terms of like mm -hmm. really factoring in all the all the bio. That's because we don't know everything. We don't know all that. It, all that. Yeah. 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 Well, things like that, and there's uh, other tools like for just doing. We're doing that kind of uh, multi-material um, like structures. Um, there's a lot of plugins in Grasshopper, uh, tools like Monolith, uh, which are kind of new tools coming out of Harvard. Uh, there's multi-material printing, and they do some really cool major studies, like um, complex major studies internally. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, well, let's get on with the program. Great. Thanks a lot, John.